Hey, what's up everybody? Tommy Craft here to bring you yet another video review. This is my third so far. I've also reviewed KMTV's 1200 watt economic HMI and their uh, 1500 CE 1500WS LED. This is their third product I reviewed. It's just happened that way. This has been the order of things that I've purchased and they've been from KM. Uh, they're good products so far, but not without their drawbacks as we'll get into in this. But for the money you save, they may very well be tolerable drawbacks for you. They are for me, that's for sure. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just uh, talk about the things I've used on, show some footage, and give my overall experience. Now, in full disclosure, I have not used the Airy unit that does the same thing, so I can't really compare the two. I can only tell you my experience with this light and how it compares to Kame's other light. And so um, one other thing, you may be able to hear the ballast running right now. You may not be able to if the mic doesn't pick it up, but it's sitting about 8 to 10 feet away from the camera, and so... It's not as noisy as their economic for now, but there is still some noise, so I wanted you to be able to hear it if the mic does indeed pick it up, and once we go into the unboxing, that sound will cut out. So, um, without further ado, I will go ahead and jump into the unboxing. One other thing, I have shot this part on the Blackmagic Cinema Camera 2.5K, and the rest of it, including the unboxing, was shot with the GH1, an old but trusty camera that I still love. So, uh, let's go ahead and get into the unboxing. So one thing you can once again always say about Came TV is that they do package their products very well. This, like my review of the HMI Fresnel, took me quite a while to get this thing out, but at least I had the experience of how it works. Now, this packaging is actually bigger than their HMI Fresnel. What I eventually wound up doing was putting the metal case for the Fresnel inside the case for the PAR, since they're so big and unwieldy. And there's my lovable little doggy there. And so here we go unpacking. The very exciting part, there's the fixture sitting there, and that's the bulb I just pulled out. They do send with it a uh, UVS version, that's UVS stop. That means it's doped specially to protect from UV rays, because, assumably, they are too cheap to put in cobalt glass on the actual fixture to protect you from UV rays. So it would be better to have double protection in the bulb and the fixture, but uh, I do measure the levels and we'll get into that a little bit later. There's the cable. It's a very solid beam connector, a heavy duty cable. I've had no issues with it. And there we go with the ballast coming out. And finally the fixture and just taking out the rest of the styrofoam and looking over all the knobs and doodads on it. The opening mechanism works very solid. The, the spot focus mechanism works very well. There's no grinding or, or scratching or squeaking or anything like that. And so now, here I go, getting ready to put together the yoke for it. This was a little bit difficult for me, especially the first time because I'm not mechanically inclined, but I did eventually figure out how all these little pieces go together. It's just basically figuring out what order the washers go in. And you basically take that biggest washer or grommet or whatever you want to call it and put it behind the metal of the yoke closest to the body of the fixture. You take this washer doodad thingy and you basically thread it onto the handle like so and then you just screw the handle on. And this uh, this worked a charm for me. Actually, somebody can tell me if I did this wrong, but I have never had an issue with it yet. It holds the yoke in place very nicely for such a heavy fixture, and you have two handles, one for each side, and they both lock. And here we go, opening up, looking at that beautiful reflector in there. Uh, it, it looks like a really solid reflector. I don't know how it compares to the Airy. Here's a nice UVS bulb. Great condition. It looked like it had only been fired for testing purposes. You just slide it in there. Now, in my experience with this unit, you do want to experiment with which, which way to insert the bulb because sometimes if you turn it and, and uh, put one uh, cathode or anode on the top or, or the bottom, it will lean one way or the other and it might scratch on the reflector. So do be careful about that. And here's our first time firing it up. Worked really solidly. Uh, you have your normal green cast coming up and eventually it stabilizes to a really nice uh, daylight temperature. This is of course sped up footage, but it takes a couple of minutes about your average time an HMI lamp takes to, to come to temperature. 
If you couldn't tell, I'm a turtle fan, but here it's just playing with the light for the first time. There's a nice shot of the ballast. It looks basically just like an airy ballast. Uh, you have all the features, and they are all functional for the most part. You have a fuse switch on and off. The, the indicator lights seem to work. I've never had the temp light come on, but I've never been in a situation where I would go over temperature. Uh, the, the ground test works really well. And uh, it's labeled as apparently you can power up to 1800 watts, but I've never tried it. And uh, here you have the information on the back. It's actually pretty accurate in terms of its power consumption, which I'm going to go into now. So here you can see I'm running at a standard give or take 118 volts in my house outlet. And the first thing I'm going to measure is 7.9 amps at the lowest power consumption setting uh, with the dimmer turned all the way down to half or at the bottom, which gives you about half brightness. And now finally cranking it up to full brightness, we get up to around 14 amps. Now here's what I will say about this light. You can technically power it on a household outlet, but you will often trip the breaker on the first striking of the lamp. Now the best conclusion I can come to for why this might be is that it's charging up the capacitors the first time you flip the switch and it doesn't get all the way to striking the lamp. It'll just trip your breaker. Every time I've had this happen, I go flip my breaker back, I try to strike the lamp again, and it works fine. So it would drive with the idea of it's powering up the capacitors, it trips the breaker, you turn it back on, it finishes powering them up, and you strike, all is good. Every time now, I just try to run it off a 20 amp circuit when possible, and I don't seem to have any trouble. And what you just saw there is the wattage readings going down from full power to taking the dimmer all the way down to zero or half again. And now we're looking on the power factor. This is where they really don't tell it to you honestly. They claim 0.98 power factor like Airy, and that's just not anywhere near the case. And if you look at the numbers reading here, your, uh, your voltage amps, your wattage, it really does not match up with a 0.98 power factor. So the kilowatt is reading right when it tells you 0.67. Now, this is really unfortunate because an Airy lamp is going to get you around 11, 12 amps for the same amount of power, which will definitely clear on your standard 15 amp circuit. And this, not so much. And the power factor does get slightly better when you bring the lamp up to full power. It's an efficiency thing about how operating at its full power gives it better power factor, I guess. I'm not exactly 100% sure there. But again, you know, take that with, with a grain of salt. The kilowatt does seem to be very accurate with the numbers it's giving based on the math between voltage amps, wattage amps, and, and actual voltage. So if you can afford to run this on a 20 amp circuit, great but you're not going to be able to run this on a generator because of the poor power factor. It's just not going to work. So keep that in mind if you're running household or any gig where you have power of 20 amps or you're willing to trip a breaker to fire it up, you should be okay. But eh, it's a big question. But moving on, there's two other things that we need to talk about before showing test footage. And the first one are the UV meter readings. Now, I bought this uh, UV meter off Amazon for cheap. That is like 100 or 200 bucks or something. It's not perfect, but it gets the job done. And this is at five feet on flood mode. And we're getting about a max of 0.6 or 7 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And then up to at 10 feet, it's basically nil. 0 0.01, 0 0.02 is what this thing fluctuates at. Now on spot, it's a different story. At five feet, you're getting some, some fairly high numbers. This is about as high as I could get it to go up to around 2.3, 2.4, you know, somewhere around there. Spot at 10 feet, it gets a little bit lower, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. You can get it up to around 1, 1 1.3 milliwatts per centimeter squared at 10 feet on the spot mode. And then when you move in to 15 to 20 feet on the spot mode, it gets much lower. It's around 0.10. So the thing is, what the sun gets up to around on a sunny day is, from what I understand, 2.53 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And the next thing that I did was I just pointed it out the window and then went down in the yard and took the meter and did some readings, and they're non-existent in the yard at spot and at flood. It's basically at the level that the meter fluctuates. So at this distance, it's totally safe. So just do not set the light right on top of your actors, which you would never do anyway because it's big, it's hot, it's bright, that's nuts. Once you get, you know, 
10 to 20 feet away, you're really solid, and especially once you blast it through diffusion. But you can see it does get really hot too, like right there at the glass, and then further away where the beam converges, it's gonna be quite hot, so you're never gonna get it really close anyway. Now the last big thing to test after the false advertising on the power factor is if the flicker free mode works. So what you see is after just starting on a 1 50th a second shutter speed, once you start to raise your shutter speed, you start getting these flickering and banding colors in your image, which is normal for a light like this. That is why for whenever you need a higher shutter speed, they introduce what's called a flicker free mode. So you can see how bad it gets once you really start raising your shutter speed. So let's go and jump over and see if the flicker free mode it actually works and the switch has been flipped and as you can see it doesn't work nothing really changes but there is a catch-22 so what you can hear there is I just flipped the switch to turn it over to 300 and you can hear the acoustic resonance of the bulb change that's completely normal even on an airy light and I started uh, at 125 I flipped over to 200 to 500 to 1000 to 2000 and then 4000 shutter speed one four thousand that's four thousandth of a second and there are no issues uh, with this light whatsoever. So it appears that the 300 hertz mode does actually fix your banding and rolling uh, lines issue, but the quote unquote flicker free mode doesn't do anything. I don't really know why that is. I'm not going to open up the ballast either to find out. So once I actually started playing with this light, I really was like a kid at Christmas. This first shot here was really fun for me because it really made me feel like I could do one of those movie shots with the moonlight for the first time in my life and I just went outside there in the snow with my turtle hoodie and stood in the light and I had fun but that isn't even the most fun let's just take a look at what happens when the snow really picks up so as you can see this thing just blasts a ton of light especially if all you're used to are tungsten lights where the max you can get is a tungsten 2k which is nothing compared to this that is if you want to plug into a household outlet I just had so much fun uh, out in the snow and in the winter wonderland and there's the fun shot right there with the spotlight pointed up but just wait it'll get even better in a little bit with that wonderful spotlight i'm surprised we didn't have aliens landing but there you can see the wonderful sparkle almost glitter like quality that you get from the snowflakes by pointing this light up and there you can just do so many fun things with this and it really gives you lighting options that you otherwise wouldn't have had if you're on a budget and if you're unable to rent in your area and finally, this is the fun stuff. Just look at that spotlight beam, especially from how far away it is, how it reflects off all the snow. I just, I just find that so cool. And there's another great shot. We're getting our Spielberg on here with this one. But this isn't even the most fun. My brother and I pointed this up on a clear day without the obscuration of the snow, and he took a couple pictures for me. Now, this one was really fun because it looks like a lightsaber from the sky. And this one was fun, too, because I got out my 1200-watt Fresnel from Came TV, and you can really see the difference in brightness. They were both set to spot mode, and the Fresnel is the one pointed off to the right, and you get a really cool light pattern. Fun fact, when I turned both those lights on, literally two minutes later, Later, I got a knock at the door. I thought it was the cops, and it was just passerby, so he wanted to know what the lights were. And then the final shot here, uh, which is really cool, the the spot, the, for the par, will actually reach up to the clouds on a good day. Now, it is a long exposure, but you could see it with the naked eye. You could see the beam touching the clouds. And for a 1,200-watt light, that is just nuts to me. And now, finally, before I go, there's one other thing. This is a short that I shot after getting the light, specifically so I could test it out. And it was a fun thing to shoot. And there's a few shots here where uh, I used it to, I think, what was great effect where I otherwise would not have been able to use a light. So for the first shot here, he bends down to pick up the paper and it makes a good key light for him on the right side of his face. And then the next shot, it doesn't last long, but it makes a really great rim light for the character Earl before he runs off to, to speak with Bob. You can see it giving a really nice light around the contours of his shoulder and his side there. And then moving forward, I continued to use it as a key light here in this shot. And then also in the next shot here, all just the light is a key light because it was a very overcast flat day and it added a little more interest to the shot. I did have something weird where on Derek's face there, originally he looked very green, but Josh's face looked completely normal in skin tone. And I'm not sure exactly why that was, if it's maybe where they were standing and Derek was getting some cast off the ground, or if it was something with the light. I'm not sure. Maybe when I shot Derek's coverage, I didn't leave it on long enough. But moving forward in the short, there's one other place I used it here, and that's where Derek is at the door and we have another two shot. And again, it's just very basic stuff. It's just a light off over the camera left. 
used as as a key light and it adds a lot of interesting contrast and that would otherwise be a very hard shot to light because tungstens would be the wrong color they would not be bright enough to compete and so i actually had that that par probably back maybe 20 feet uh pointing at derek there to give him that nice contrast on his face so as you can see uh, it's a great light if you know how to work with it and I did not use any diffusion on this. It was all just open face. And I will say one other thing finally before going that you will want a lens for this. I still do not have one uh, because I've not needed one yet. But lensing will collect the light better because without it, you will get uh, certain hot spots or dark spots, basically like what I'm showing you here. So here we are at the full spot and then you go out the full flood and you can see how you get that dark spot in the middle and you also get the weird artifacting. This is normal with PAR lights if you don't have a lens and this does not come with one and lenses can be kind of pricey, upwards of $100 or $200 or more. So keep that in mind, but especially if you're going to blast this through diffusion or if you get it at the right angle, it's not a problem. You just really don't have to have to know how to work with these lights within your budget and uh, if you have a ton of money then you're probably going to buy an airy anyway so it doesn't really apply but anyway that's all i have for you on this review if you have questions be sure to leave them in the comments or hit me up i'd be happy to answer them thanks for watching and i hope you found it helpful